this week on Extracts, political snafus, evil tattoos, oops, that's one more thing I'm into. It's the accidental kink episode. Welcome to Extrax, a podcast where we introduce each other to our fandoms one episode at a time. I'm your host, Aaron Klein, an X-Files spooky bitch. And I'm your other host, Stella Cheeks, a slut for Star Trek The Original Series. Each podcast, we pick two episodes that fit a cinematic theme, watch them together, and then record our feelings. Our theme this week is Accidental Kink. <laughs> It's funny every time one of us says it. (laughs) My episode pick this week is Alan of Troyes from season three, and it's the episode that inspired this whole damn theme. This is one of those, we picked this theme as a joke, but then we decided it's actually hilarious, so we decided to do it. (laughs) Kirk has a lot of skills. He's a good captain. He has sex magic at the ready. He can monologue any computer to death, and he can smell one of his own. (laughs) It's the Battle of the Brats. (laughs) <laughs> it's truly a wild episode that also features a B-plot of war prevention because they had to sneak some, quote, plot in there to get the BDSM past the censors. <laughs> and we're jumping to season four with the Scully-centered episode, Never Again. In this one, Scully ditches Mulder, hooks up with a stranger, gets a tattoo, slash discovers that she really enjoys both of those things, and then is almost murdered to death by the same strange man and his tattoo. Also, we get a... Really great guest spot from Stella's favorite, Jodie Foster. <laughs> also, also, do I want this tattoo? Yeah, I probably do. <laughs> you already kind of have one of the tattoos. I know, I do have one of these tattoos. <laughs> Which is funny because I was there when you got it. I and I was like, I don't get this reference. <laughs> <laughs> I just love that Never Again tattoo. It's so cool. It's very pretty. I'm surprised you don't have it. I am too, a little bit. <laughs> <laughs> if you got that, how many X-Files tattoos would you have? Three. <laughs> yeah. Three, yeah. Okay. I want at least two more. I'm currently sitting at two Star Trek tattoos, but I have ideas for at least two more. <laughs> yeah. I have two Battlestar Galactica tattoos, and I want at least one more of those, too. Nerds. <laughs> <laughs> Ready to dig it in there, Mr. Spock? Always. I must ask you and your crew to respect, or at least tolerate their arrogance. Friction must be kept at a minimum. Yes, that I can understand. And now for a quick... Ish. <laughs> Episode summary. Really stretching that here. <laughs> it's a hard ish in this episode. <laughs> The Enterprise has been ordered to conduct a secret mission by Starfleet. The crew is to escort Elan, Dolmen of Alas, to the planet Troyes, where she is to marry the Troyan king to secure peace between the two planets. During the slow trip to Troyes, the Troyan ambassador, Petri, is to teach the Dolmen the manners and customs of his people. Easier said than done. Unfortunately, the Dolman is a spoiled brat who refuses to comply. She orders the crew around, destroys the items in her grasp, and screams at her perceived enemies. Kirk suggests Petri use a strong hand with the Dolman because she respects strength. Go in with strength. Which is questionable advice, but Kirk can't worry about that because a Klingon warship has been detected traveling along the Enterprise, ignoring their hails. But Kirk also can't focus on that because the Dolman stabs Petri in the back when he, quote, win and strong. Petri blames Kirk for the stabbing, which, fair, and refuses to have any other dealings with her. Sigh. Chapel asks Petri why, if the women of Alas are so violent, do men flock to them? And he explains that it's not magic that ensnares the men, but a biological agent in their tears that enslaves them forever. I don't know, sounds like sex magic to me. Of course, Kirk hears nothing of this because he's too upset that he has the, quote, honor of teaching the Dolman. Alan is less than thrilled by Kirk's efforts to educate her and slaps him, but the joke's on her because he slaps her right back and threatens to spank her. Kinky! <laughs> Finding Kirk a suitable mate, Alan puts the love potion whammy on Kirk and cries on him and then asks him to spank her, which he absolutely does. Yeah. <laughs> we don't see that, but he absolutely does do that. <laughs> the next scene is literally him with sex hair. Yeah. <laughs> Meanwhile, in engineering, Crichton, Elan's chief bodyguard and ex-boyfriend, tampers with the warp engines and contacts the Klingon ship. Of course, he's a dummy wearing several placemats and is caught... (laughs) He's literally wearing placemats. Kirk reluctantly tears himself away from Elan's bed to deal with Crichton, but before they can interrogate him using a questionable mind meld, he kills himself. Kirk asks Elan if she knew of Crichton's sabotage plan, and she deflects rerouting their conversation into a ferocious kiss, a kiss that is walked in on by Bones and Spock. It takes a terrific amount of time to pull himself free after several Jim, Jim, Jim. (laughs) 
And he confesses that he did touch her tears and, oh, no, Bones, I need an antidote. Don't worry, he's on it. (laughs) Kirk somehow makes it to the bridge to, you know, do his damn job. And through the sex fog, he realizes that the Klingon ship is antagonizing them to get them to fight and blow up their own ship. Scotty confirms that Crichton sabotaged their dilithium crystals and the antimatter reactor control system, making it impossible to go to warp or to fire their weapons. Alan joins Kirk on the bridge, reluctantly wearing her Trojan royal jewels and wedding dress, having accepted her fate as a war bride, but wanted to die by Kirk's side if they should perish. Spock detects a strange energy reading from Alan's necklace, and wouldn't you know that really common crystals are dilithium? No wonder the Klingons want control of this sector. Spock and Spotty do some questionable science and repair the ship just in time for the Enterprise to damage the Klingon ship, causing it to flee. Alan gifts Kirk her favorite dagger as a farewell gift and leaves for her wedding. A heartbroken Alan cries silently as she is beamed away from Kirk forever. Back on the bridge, an elated McCoy bounces up to Spock with the antidote to Alan's tears. But turns out he was too late. Because as Spock put it, the Enterprise infected the captain long before the Dolman did, and there is no antidote for the Enterprise. <laughs> How did you feel about this episode? I liked it. It's weird. <laughs> <laughs> sure is, pal. <laughs> it's very weird. It's weird that it's like two separate episodes. It feels like, okay, here's this episode about this, like, Horrible bitch, <laughs> basically, <laughs> who needs to be like tamed and controlled. It's very Taming of the Shrew. It's like it absolutely is same. It is Helen of Troy meets Taming of the Shrew. Yeah, we're big fucking loser nerds here at Star Trek. <laughs> Let's just do this classical theater bullshit. Yeah, exactly. And it's like I have this, I had this like weird reaction to it at the end. By the time that she's like tamed, it was like. Oh, this is exactly how I feel at the end of Taming of the Shrew. Yeah, where it's unsatisfied. Like, it, it's so bizarre because it's like, wow, she's such a horrible bitch. And so you have like no sympathy for her, basically. And then you get to the end and it's like, wow, they did a really good job of making her sympathetic. Oh, also, they like took her whole personality away. Yeah. But I like, too, that she's like, I don't have anything except obligations now. So I like that she's not like thrilled about it. Mm. It's not like she's giving a Kate-esque monologue at the end where she's like, my wifely duties are right. my life I find now. it a lot more satisfying than the ending of Taming of the Shrew because at least like, I don't know, there are, there are definite, definite problems with it that we'll talk about, but it does seem like Elan does choose Kirk. She's like, oh, right. I am, I am in, I like this strength. I like this. I like the spanking. The spanking. And like, so she bequeaths her tears onto him, knowing that that is like supposed to be a forever bond. Right. There's no antidote. So she is, that's essentially like a mating ritual that she enacts. So she ties herself to him. And then after tying herself to him, they kind of like acquiesce to each other. So at least like she's, she is more receptive to the learning and more right. receptive to like obligations. And she sees him give up her for obligations. And so like mm-hmm. she kind of mimics him, which is better than at the end of Taming of the Shrew where she's like, I have no personality. Fuck all of you guys. Yeah. <laughs> I guess I'll just get down on my knees where I belong. <laughs> yes, exactly. Because <laughs> I've seen a lot of productions where they try and like shoehorn in a new mes- message. And it's like, that's not, that's just, not. Just don't do the monologue. Just don't do it. Just cut it if you want to have a new message. There's no real feminist retelling of that monologue. (laughs) Sorry, friendos. No, not at all. (laughs) Yeah, it's... Yeah, I I had very mixed feelings about how her character changes at the end. Because I agree. I like that she has more agency, but it does feel really weird to be like, oh, this is really satisfying. Oh, wait. Ew. (laughs) Like, it it was very strange. And then there's this, like you said, this (laughs) B-plot... (laughs) Of, like, war prevention. Also, we get to see, like, an actual military battle, which does not happen super often that I've seen yet. And so I really enjoyed that part of it. But it was very strange to be like, okay, we've been doing this Taming of the Shrew plot, and then (laughs) here we go, naval battle. Like, what the fuck is happening? But it does, like, reinforce that, like, overarching series theme of Kirk is always going to leave these women for the Enterprise. Yes, like, yeah, absolutely. I liked, even before Spock said that, I wrote that in my notes, like, Kirk is never going to give up the Enterprise. Like, he's always going to be, that is the woman of his life. Like, 
bones will always be snapped out of sex magic by, oh my god, there's a medical problem. I'm so interested in this. Spock will always be snapped out of whatever Vulcan-related sex magic he's being subjected to by, ooh, there's science. I'm very interested or in this. Or look at Kirk's big fat ass. <laughs> look at dead ass over there. <laughs> Scotty will always be released because of things that are going on with the Enterprise, but that are like more engineering related. And Kirk will always be snapped out of sex magic by, I am the captain of this ship and this is my obligation. I think so I he like does, that. I think he does a really good job acting that throughout you see him like that you see that struggle in him physically and emotionally of like I want to give in to Elan because I've been whammied and then I'm struggling because like I my duties to the ship yeah yeah I enjoyed that and I like too that scene where he like knows how to out logic the guards by having Spock be there to shoot them basically yeah this is pre whammy right exactly so it's like you can see that he has the he even says, I don't understand women. Women are super unpredictable. Vulcan women are the only ones that are predictable <laughs> because they're logical, basically. And so I like that he also has this, I like, you get this sense of his sex magic that it's just, I listen and understand women, basically, which is kind of nice. Also, like, I am also kind of a chaotic brat. I can <laughs> make... Absolutely. What would I do in this situation? Probably that. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yes. And so I like that you get this, like sense of his process into like how I'm going to deal with this problem, which I liked a lot. Also, I like that. I mean, by the time he slaps her, you kind of want to slap her. Like she is a horrible bitch. And like, this is a, it feels like a practical reaction. And especially for the sixties to like, yeah, we're just going to slap this woman. In the she face. slaps him pretty hard first. Uh, yeah, exactly. And so it feels like warranted that there's this like exchange of blows basically. Well, and it's immediately, she's like, this is the one. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Which is part of the, like, when I watched it, I was like, this is the accidental kick yeah. moment of, like, oh, I'm into this. Yes. <laughs> yeah, I like that. And I like how there's also that moment where she, like, locks herself in the closet, basically. And he's like, whatever. I will get Spock. I will get McCoy. Someone else will be more than happy to do this. She's like, wait, what? I'm into someone being mean to me. <laughs> like, She's like, no, 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 don't leave. Wait, don't go, don't go, don't go. Wait, 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 wait. And like, I thought at first it was going to be part of a plot that she was involved with the Klingon like sabotage stuff yeah. and that like she was crying on purpose in order to make him like her bitch basically right. she was like I don't really pay attention to politics I'm, I'm like a spoil I'm a literal spoiled rich princess that yeah. nobody can say no to right yeah yeah so I liked that in the end it wasn't oh I'm also involved in this plot that I'm doing this it was just like my ex-boyfriend got jealous and tried to kill you all. Oops, sorry. <laughs> also tried to kill her, kind of. Yes. Yeah. If I can't have you, no one can. Which is like the difference between like Crichton and Kirk. Kirk's like, no, you literally, I want to have you, but I can't. Right. Goodbye. Yeah. I have I have obligation. You have obligation. We just have to forget what happened. <laughs> <laughs> we have to forget the spankings. I imagine her at her like, wedding night being like, so are you going to spank me or what? Right? Like, <laughs> and then the like king being like, I'm what? <laughs> <laughs> I'm civilized. She's like, yeah, but I need you to not be civilized for a second. <laughs> I'm not into that. <laughs> uh, I like that idea, though, that she then goes to the... Tro- Troy, the Troyans, the Troyans, and is like, listen, I uh, gave a lot of things up, and what you're gonna do for me is I'm gonna teach you about this Earth ritual called spanking, and you're gonna <laughs> fucking do it. <laughs> I bet the king's like, I, I guess. <laughs> I just picture them all being tired old queens, like the ambassador, and so I love the idea of him being like. <laughs> <laughs> you will wear the dress. <laughs> just put the dress. On. I love that you said it was a real Michael Caine miscongeniality vibes. <laughs> yes! That's exactly what it felt like. A hundred percent what the ambassador is. Put the shoes on. I don't want to wear the shoes. You have to wear the shoes. I love the progression of his character, too, where he's like, we're so much better because we're so civilized mm-hmm. and like. We're very logical and we're very peaceful. And then like literally four seconds with this woman, he's like, I want her dead. I want her whole planet dead. (laughs) (laughs) I like that he's in bed recovering from being stabbed in the back. And he's like, and this is where I am. And this is where I shall stay. This is where you put me. And this is where I shall stay. Uh, I love that scene where he's like, please, God, we're going to die. Please put the dress on. Just please wear the necklace. She's just like, I don't know about this. And there's just McCoy in the background like, how did this soap opera end up in my fucking sick bay? <laughs> it's like, I don't even get to bang anybody. 
I had to watch you just like go at it. I loved that. I loved that scene where they open the door and they're both just like pissed. <laughs> <laughs> like here's us watching this happen and we are not happy about mm, it. Jim. Jim. <laughs> Though as soon as they get him out of the room, they do have a lot of sympathy for him. They're yeah. like, did you get whammied? Oh, he's been whammied. <laughs> oh, fuck. <laughs> this is not good. <laughs> did she Did she cry on you? Did you get her tears? He's like, uh, just rubbing his hand like <laughs> Lady Macbeth style. <laughs> <laughs> they're like uh oh <laughs> we know what this means <laughs> I love that scene where Petri's like you're not gonna find an antidote and Bones is like fucking watch me <laughs> <laughs> you come into my sick bed <laughs> get your ass back in bed <laughs> I am 100% fueled by spite <laughs> right <laughs> I love that scene of him and Chapel working together too because I love Chapel being just like the most competent assistant of all fucking time basically She's like here's this one here's that one and he's like oh I'm so frustrated but give me 12 more minutes and I'll find an antidote also the scene where Chapel is like so if they're all horrible cunts how do they get uh, like <laughs> right. why do people fall in love with them just you know a little data collection just, uh, curious no I'm definitely not gonna go harvest her tears in any <laughs> she walks away like this is great information <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah this was uh it was a fucking wild ride i like don't really know how else to describe it it was a wild episode there's so much that happens in this episode there's so much that happens i love how much Spock hates her and never stops hating her <laughs> like every reaction to her is just this Bitch. Do you think that she should be on the bridge, Captain? (laughs) Do you think this bitch should be on the bridge, Captain? There's some energy coming from someone. It's from this bitch! (laughs) (laughs) That's definitely a moment. That's a good writing moment, too, because, like, you definitely thought, like, oh, we're definitely going to know that she's, like, betrayed everybody now. She's actually a bad guy. And it's like, oh, no, she's just wearing this fucking necklace. Right. Yeah. I like that. I like that you get this, like, surprise that she's not really evil it's just part of her culture that she's a spoiled fucking brat right, like that would make sense if she's like if she is high enough in the ro- royal family that she is you know bequeathed as a war bride be- yeah and and but she also has but low enough in the war- royal family that she doesn't have a say in anything yeah like why would she know about all this political intrigue she's just like a spoiled rotten brat mm-hmm who has no table manners. None. <laughs> this is I a literally, plate. <laughs> we put food on it. I literally wrote, oh, she's eating like Dean Winchester. <laughs> <laughs> Chugging on this wine bottle. <laughs> uh. <laughs> so ridiculous. Uh, yeah, it was, yeah, it was good and I really enjoyed it, but it just felt like, a mess, but like a good mess. Yeah, like the the pieces come together. Yeah, totally. Like there aren't really any plot holes, but it is just chaotic. Yes, absolutely. It just feels like absolute fucking bisexual chaotic energy up and down this whole damn ship. Welcome to the Enterprise. <laughs> <laughs> I would give so much money to travel back in time and have them reshoot it and have a lot of coverage on like Ahura and Sulu while like all this Dolman shit is happening on the bridge. Like we needed more coverage from the crew being like, what the fuck? Well, there was like some good shots of Ahura in the background too, just being like, what? This bitch? Especially because she's like, I gave up my quarters? Yeah, she's pissed. Can you imagine being Ahura and coming back and being like, oh, all my shit is broken. <laughs> also, did the captain fuck on my bed? <laughs> I like to think that Kirk had her whole quarters like completely yeah, cleaned totally up to down. He would, he would. Yeah, he's like, respectful. I'm going to put you in the nicest other quarters that we have, and I will make sure that this is sanitized. <laughs> he would do that for his best. Yeah, absolutely, 100. <laughs> percent I did love that scene though, where they're like, oh, the dolman is complaining about the quarters, and her immediately is like, "What?" Because <laughs> Horner, her is like banging quarters. Her room rules. It's really nice. <laughs> Then you see the dolman like, I need pillows? For what? What do I need this? And Kirk's like, I'll just fill it top to bottom with breakable shit for you. What the fuck do you want from me? I do love the final shot of the scene, too, where where Bones com- comes in and is like, I got the antidote. And then he has that exchange with Spock. And he's like, oh, well, the captain you know, was infected with the Enterprise long before the dolman. There's no cure for, for the Enterprise. And Spock like agrees and is like, I'm inclined to agree. And 
Bones literally just like stops and looks very confused and then just slowly looks at Spock like, did you just, did you just fucking agree with me? <laughs> and that's how the episode ends. It's like a nice little Bones. And it's over two shots. It's a close up of like McCoy's face like falling in confusion and then like an out, a big shot of the whole ship and in the background you can see McCoy just slowly fucking look at Spock like, okay. <laughs> that was weird. <laughs> Well, we're all going against our instincts, huh? It's not exactly space laughter, but it's got a similar vibe. <laughs> space confusion. Oh, fuck. <laughs> it, it's a hard back to back from our last episode too, where it was just like spones aggressively about to fucking kill each other, yeah, aggressively battling with each other. To this of them like working together to help overcome Jim's. Sex magic succumbing, I guess. <laughs> Whatever, man. <laughs> so this is the only episode in TOS that was directed and written by the same person. It was written by John Meredith Lucas. And I think that's part of the reason that it, even though it is a chaotic time, it does actually make sense. Like, there is clearly a story that this person wanted to tell. And I do think that, like, using the Taming of the Shrew, but also the, like, Helen of Troy, like, Alan and then Troyus, like, that makes a yeah. lot of sense. I, I think that sometimes their classical references are heavy-handed in a not good way. I think this one is really good. Mm -hmm. There is a sequel novel written called Firestorm, and it uh, deals with what became of Elan after her marriage on Troyes. And I've never read it, but when I read about this, I immediately bought it. And it's in the mail right now, and I'm very excited to read it because I want to know what the fuck happens between these two. <laughs> and I also want to know what the king is like. Like, is he... Right. Yeah, I want to know what happens. Yeah, I'm very curious what the king is like. Well, I'll let you know. <laughs> uh, yeah, I have no doubt. <laughs> so I made a joke in the episode summary about the guards' outfits being made from placemats. They were. They were made from literal placemats. I did not doubt you for even a moment that that was true. <laughs> they are just incredible outfits. They're terrible. They are insane. Just like red and gold placemats. <laughs> well, they're supposed to look like Roman armor, I guess. I guess. It read. I mean, as soon as they got on, it was like, okay, I understand what your purpose is. You're obviously these, like, guards or whatever. Can you imagine just walking around in plastic placements? <laughs> like, it would be so sweaty. Yeah. Very sweaty. <laughs> also, you notice this, that the dolman actually gets, like, a bunch of costume changes. A bunch of she, dope costume changes? All of her costumes are great. She's got four costumes. She's got the purple, like, placement outfit that she comes up on, yeah. which is, like, hilarious that a couple episodes ago it was like, we can't show on navel. And it's like, what the fuck was this then? <laughs> yeah. show everything but and belly button. Jesus Christ. No belly buttons. Yeah, there's everything else strip. is fine. <laughs> <laughs> and then she gets that like mesh outfit with the like decals on it. Yeah, like, the like silver one. Yeah. yeah. And then that really banging like the orange orange. Yeah. It's very 70s style yes. dress. It looks like something that you would wear to oh my god, Studio 54. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> I wanted to say Studio 70 and was like that's not right. Studio 70 from the 70s. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, it looks very Studio 54 like someone would rock up wearing that for 100%. Sure. And then she has the wedding dress on yes. at the end. They're good. They're good outfits. They're no con, but they're good. I mean, for ladies, yeah, I would say that's the standard now for costume changes. Like, we've had a couple of really good change to caftans, but yes. like, for variety and color and also like, they're all pretty structure, flattering too. Yeah, they're Even very flattering. The weird, like, placemat one is very <laughs> flattering. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And like, the colors all look good on her. She's really orange. Is that, I like, okay. So, <laughs> I was like, is this. Blackface. Is that what we're saying? Okay, good. Yeah. Bobby will probably talk about her more. So the actress that plays Alan is France Nguyen, and she's believed to be the first Vietnamese actor to appear on American television. Okay. I don't know if that's actually true, but like it's definitely, you know, apocrypha. She had previously starred with William Shatner on Broadway for two years in the title role of The World of Susie Wong, and then she later guest starred with William Shatner as husband and wife in Kung Fu Season 3 in an episode called A Small Beheading. So I think that's really fun that they have this, like... They have great chemistry. They have excellent chemistry, and I think that comes across, like, really well in this episode. Yeah, so I think it's really... I think even though I, I personally read this episode as her choosing him and them acquiescing to each other a lot, it can easily be read in a different way, right? Like mm -hmm. she is a woman of color. She is an Asian woman and she is presented as a savage. Like he yeah. literally calls her a savage at one point. She's eating like a monster and is like a cunt the yeah. whole time. <laughs> and then she gets 
bedded by a white man. And then there's like a, a white savior kind of complex where she then becomes like submissive and like mm-hmm. does what he wants. Um, So like it's not great. <laughs> it's not like but it, it again follows that like taming of the shrew vibe where it's like there are really fun good moments in that play and plays and parts where you can see like a genuine connection between Kate and Petruchio and you're like oh is this a love story and then you're like wait a minute is this a love story yeah (laughs) and so I think it really falls in that that same pattern but with the addition of like a person of color it does raise some like questionable but I think that also goes back when we've talked before of like the pitfalls of like colorblind casting, right? Like it's really, really great that the show from the 60s has a really like incredibly diverse cast, but they don't in many ways don't think about how certain choices read. And I I tend to think that this was probably one of those situations where they're like, oh, this actress is like really beautiful. Like William Shatner already has a relationship with her. Like this will be great. We're not really realizing or thinking about how it changes the context of the show to have a woman of color in this position. Right. Yeah. Yeah. But overall, just like a fucking crazy episode. Yeah. I think that actress is really good. Like, yes. it is. I think she does a great job. Yeah. I think, first of all, she's fucking stunning. She's so yes. pretty. So, like, it makes sense that she would has falls into that, like, Helen of Troy ideal. But, like, the I think the shift from her being, like, a spoiled bratty princess to, like, somebody who falls in love and then to somebody who steps up and does their duty mm-hmm. is really believable. And yeah. considering how much was going on in this episode and how fucking chaotic this episode is, like that takes some acting chops and she does a really good job. Yeah, I would agree with that. Synopsis showdown? Yeah, let's do it. Kirk faces off with a formidable opponent in the form of a sex magic wielding princess brat, but is ultimately undeterred because game recognized game and he knows exactly how to deal with her brand of kinky. <laughs> <laughs> A terror of a woman is brought on the ship and uses some biochemical warfare to make Kirk fall in love with her. But unfortunately for her, Jim will never bottom harder for any woman than the Enterprise. (laughs) That was a good one. (laughs) Thank you. Are you ready for Scully? It's me. Yes. Look, Mulder, I have to go. What, do you got a date or something? You're kidding. All right. A quick-ish episode summary. (laughs) Quicker. Quicker, yeah. (laughs) A man is very sad in a bar after losing his kids in a divorce settlement and decides to go across the street and get an impulsive tattoo of a sailor girl on the moniker Never Again. The next day at work, he hears a woman call him a loser and lashes out at a female co-worker who is like, literally, what the fuck? I didn't say anything to you, you insane psycho. Cut back to Washington where Mulder and Scully are meeting with a Russian informant who claims to have information about UFOs. In a super dick move, Mulder dumps all of the follow-up work on Scully and heads out to go on a quote-unquote spiritual vacation in Graceland. Scully, understandably, is like, you know what? Fuck this! And decides (laughs) to have a crisis about where her life is headed, slash is firmly turned in the direction of. Meanwhile, Ed is fired over the telephone and he hears the same woman's voice mocking him. He assumes it's his downstairs neighbor and screams at her and after being set off by some Jehovah's Witnesses in the hallway, promptly murders his neighbor. Only, just kidding, the voice wasn't his neighbor. The call was coming from inside his own skin because it's actually the voice of his shiny new impulse tattoo. Scully, against her own wishes, has followed the informant to Philly and sees him head into the very same tattoo shop as the murderous tattoo, where she discovers Ed arguing with the owner, saying he wants his tattoo removed. He asks Scully out, but she declines. After calling Mulder to tell him the informant is not trustworthy and actually part of the Russian mob, and feeling even more frustration at his molderness, she decides to go out for dinner with Ed after all. She notices that he's fucked his tattoo up by burning it with a cigarette for some reason and lets him convince her that actually she should get a tattoo, which she does and is very into. They go back to Ed's house and even though the tattoo tells Ed she'll die if he kisses her, he does it anyway and they definitely fuck. Again, don't see it in this one either. (laughs) But you know what happened. But it definitely happened. The next morning, while Ed is out, two police officers come looking for him. They figured out that his neighbor was murdered and found a strange chemical in the blood that was left behind. Scully tries calling Mulder, but hangs up before he answers, deciding maybe involving him isn't actually a great idea. Probably a good call, actually. (laughs) When Ed comes back, she manages to hide her FBI badge from him, but does tell him that they discovered his neighbor and about the chemical and tells him that they should go to the hospital and get checked out. The tattoo rats her out and tells Ed to call back whoever she was talking to, and he discovers that she's a fed. As they are getting ready to leave, he attacks her 
her and wraps her in a sheet, preparing to throw her into the furnace. At the last moment, he overcomes the power of the tattoo and shoves his arm into the furnace, burning off the tattoo. Back in D.C., we learned that the tattoos had some kind of chemical in the ink that caused hallucinations. And while Scully also had some in her blood, it wasn't nearly at the levels of what, at what Ed's was. Though, that would actually explain a lot of her fucking wild-ass behavior. But only some. Mulder congratulates Scully on being the first person to make an appearance in two separate X-Files and ponders whether this even would have happened if they hadn't gotten to this fight about a desk. To which Scully is like, you know what, Mulder? Fuck you. <laughs> <laughs> what did you think of this episode? This is an episode that I've known about for a really long time because, again, as previously stated, I was there with you when you got your Ouroboros tattoo Mm -hmm. and you, like, tried to explain it to me and I was like, cool, whatever, I'm just here because I'm your friend. (laughs) And we live down the street from this tattoo parlor and I don't have anything else to do. (laughs) Um, So I've been aware of this episode and I've definitely seen the Betty Page style tattoo before because I feel like, especially just like getting into the X-Files and obviously part of the reason I or part of the way I show my fandom is like must buy bullshit. <laughs> so I've <laughs> definitely seen like, you know, stickers and stuff with that on. Yeah. So this is a an episode that's been in my mind mm-hmm. in a different way for quite a while. So it was fun to actually see it and I think it's like a it's a really good episode. I think cuz like I obviously know lots of what happens because we watch this out of order. Mm-hmm. So at, um, I turned to you and I was like, does she know that she has cancer? Because she's definitely acting like somebody who just got like very bad news. So it makes a lot of sense that she's like starting to question her like, what the fuck am I doing here with the X-Files? I don't even have a fucking desk. This guy's a moron. <laughs> <laughs> like, is this really how I want to spend my last like however many you know years or months on this earth? Like, I don't think that is what I want to be doing. <laughs> and having this like self-reflection, I think it was really smart of the writers to like get Mulder out of the way for, and this to be more of like a Scully focused episode with her by herself. Like, yeah, they have like fun conversation stuff, but I think that was really smart. I think it's for an episode about like an evil tattoo is like a really good episode about like self discovery and like, and how you deal with like personal trauma. Cause like she goes through this fucked up thing where she like, Gets a tattoo and goes to a questionable bar, a questionable bar, and fucks a random dude who turns out to be a fucking murderer. And like, she definitely comes out of it on the other side, like still like, uh, fuck you, Mulder, but also like being like, maybe just going reckless is not the <laughs> the way to deal with this. So like, she kind of gets it out of her system, which I think is interesting, especially because she does live a very dangerous life because she's in the you know FBI and also is in the X Files. Yeah. <laughs> so it's not like like girl, you don't gotta go looking for it. <laughs> It's here. <laughs> like, you're good. I thought she was really, I thought Jillian Anderson was really like, gave a really powerful performance in this episode about a fucking weird magic tattoo. Like it's a, it's a really like understated and subtle performance. And like, it's a lot more powerful for that. Like her like whole monologue of basically being like, I have really fucked up daddy issues. Yeah. Um, and like being so blunt about it with a stranger, but also like. Well, there's the, like the anonymity of being with a stranger. Totally. Like, I can tell this person something because I'm going to leave and you'll never. Who are you? I Absolutely. can say anything. Well, and also the idea that like you can be aware of your personality flaws or like shortcomings or whatever. You can be aware of your shit but still like totally not be in control of it and be like well I'm gonna date this teacher and I'm gonna date this dude that's way older than me like yep so it's really it's an interesting thought process of like oh I'm aware of it I can't control it yeah but I'm aware of it which I feel like is a lot of Scully's like whole deal like yeah I'm very smart but you know I can't stop this roller coaster that I'm on (laughs) I also think that the guy that they got that that plays the um, that plays Ed does a really good job. Like he's, he's obviously well very handsome in a like Ethan Hawke '90s way, but he does a good job of like losing his mind and mm-hmm. like trying to cover it up. And I think the set deck is really good on this and this like loser apartment. And I don't know. I think this is a really good episode. I'm I like it a lot. Yeah, good. I'm <laughs> Mulder's glad. an idiot in the background. Very good. <laughs> See Mulder do the Graceland punch. Yeah. <laughs> Do you think it's funny? Like, I don't know what it is about our pop culture that, like, dudes named Eddie get, like, symbiotes. (laughs) A less sexy symbiote this time around, but, you know. Fair enough, fair enough. (laughs) It's funny that you bring that up, too, that you asked if she knew that she had cancer. Because that in the order that these aired, this comes right after Leonard Betts, which we'll get to. And you'll see that one next season, season three of Extracts. It's a fucking great episode. And the, like, 
delivery of how she finds out that she has cancer is really fucked up. And like, I think in the order it's like of the- Chuck Norris, like you have AIDS kids or Walker told me I have AIDS. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> kinda. Yeah. It like, it really comes out of nowhere. And she's like, Oh, what? <laughs> like it's very fucked up. And so in the order that this airs, it's like, you're right. It does feel like absolutely like a trauma response. They were not supposed to be that way. This was supposed to come before Leonard Betts. So this is supposed to come right before she finds out that she has cancer. So they, Which would have worked in a different way. Like she's yes. feeling like her life is like out of control. Because, she's losing like, direction. She doesn't need a cancer diagnosis to like look at Mulder and be like, what am I doing with my life? Like, yeah. And it, I think it's more effective this way. But I still think it would have been effective because she would have this whole like self-discovery. Like, what am I doing with my life? And then finding out a cancer diagnosis and then being like, oh, shit, what am I doing with my life? Would have still worked. But I do think that this does feel like a trauma response. Right. Yeah. And I like that. I like that they wound up switching them. The reason that they wound up switching them is because this aired on Sundays. And so it came on after the Super Bowl. And so the episode that they switched this with Leonard Betts where she finds out that she has cancer. They aired it after the Super Bowl. And so they wanted an episode that had more of both of them having a role in it, even though like this is a fucking and great like episode. a bombshell. Like, yeah, announcement. exactly. Like, so people would like turn like, you have to see this episode. Right. Exactly. Yeah. And so, but when they filmed it, they did this one first. And so Jillian Anderson was like, you know, if I had known that we were going to switch the airing order of this and this was going to be directly after finding out that she had cancer, I probably would have played this a little differently. But I think it works. I think that like this reckless abandonment of I don't know what the fuck I'm doing and I'm really upset. I don't even have a fucking desk. I don't even have a fucking desk. Like, I love it. I think it works out super, super well. And like, this is such a fucking great episode in so many ways. This was written because this is a uh, Morgan and Wong episode. Julian Anderson went to them and specifically asked them to write an episode about Scully and that explored more of her dark side. She was like, you know, we're fucking four seasons in, like, let's do some more exploring of like Scully. And this is really the first time we get like a whole Scully episode. Yeah. And it works really well because you do you get this great monologue about like, I'm very self-aware, but I feel like I'm not in control. I feel like I'm not, I'm, it's not even that I'm moving in a circle. I'm moving in this like, horrible forward backward line pattern that never seems like it's ever going to end and that like self-awareness of this she there was a great quote from her that i wanted to read so i thought it was a great idea i personally was going through a dark period at the time and i wanted to explore scully's dark period for some reason glenn and jim were on the same wavelength that week afterward a lot of people told me that the episode i was so quote-unquote unlike scully or that it showed my range i told them i thought that they were wrong i don't think that that what i did here was out of character for scully the only thing different is that the audience hadn't seen it before which I like. And I feel like if this is how she's picturing Scully's background work and like obviously as a theater actor, that's like something you're really encouraged to think about and look into. Like it makes sense that she's like already conceptualized this for Scully and it's like, I want to do more with this. So I like that so a lot. Weird. I don't feel like it fell out of character at all. I didn't either. Even without like the like knowing about the cancer diagnosis, like again, four seasons in, we do see Scully like go through a lot of dark struggles, like thinking about the episode where her dad dies mm-hmm. or the episode where she's like kidnapped by that like body swapping Bonnie and Bonnie and Clyde couple or yeah. whatever. Like that stuff is pretty dark and she goes through or the I guess yeah, the episode where she dies is is the one with or where her where her dad dies is the one with the like psychic guy, right? Yeah, Brad yeah. Dorf's character. Yeah. Yeah, like that's a dark episode and she's really dark in that. Mm-hmm. And I feel like you see her struggling with that. So like can, thinking of all that stuff that's already been established on top of having to work with a chaotic like psycho (laughs) psycho who is rude and self-centered and like does care about scully in his own way but like cares about himself and his mission more at least at this point like Mm -hmm. it would be exhausting and it would piss you off and it would be like why what am i doing here with this fucking guy who doesn't even care about me enough to get like make sure i get a desk but here i am doing as i'm i'm told as i always fucking do Mm -hmm. (laughs) like and him just being like, I knew you wouldn't abandon me. Like him, he, he's so, he relies on her so much that he just assumes that she will be there, which is also really a par- like an interesting parallel that the main character is going through a divorce, right? Like that's a huge like reason why people get divorced. Like mm-hmm. you just assumed I would be here always, right. that you didn't put any effort into our relationship and our relationship is over. And that is a very interesting parallel between like Scully and Mulder. And then at the end, he's like, he totally misses what's going on with her. And he's like, so this is just about a desk. And she's like, 
fuck you. It's yeah. not just about a desk. Yeah. Nothing is just about anything. My life doesn't revolve around you, you piece of shit. Yeah. And I like that moment, too, at the end where she's like, it's my life. It's my life that I'm dealing with. And he doesn't. I mean, he's about to say this, but doesn't. Is It's my but life, the too. the X-Files are my life. No, I think what he means is that her life oh. is his life. And I think that that like that's the beginning, in my opinion, of Mulder, like really realizing like, oh, shit, I am tied to you in a way that I didn't realize before. And if I lose you, I'm going to be deeply, deeply upset That's about fair. it. And so I feel like that moment of them at the end where she's like, my life doesn't have to be fucking about you. And he's realizing, oh my God, my life is about you. I think really sets the tone too going forward because like in a season and a half, he's already like, I'm in love with you. Straight yeah. up, I'm in love with you. And so I feel like this is like one of those real beginning moments of that where he's like, I knew I could trust you. I knew I could rely on you. I, we're on the same page. And she's like, we're not fucking on the same page. I need you to put more effort in. And he's like, oh, fuck. Yeah. Uh-oh. <laughs> I've truly fucked this up. It's like a real moment of realization for him after spending a whole episode being an incredible piece of shit. Yeah, truly. Another fun thing about this episode, Jillian Anderson specifically asked them to write like a passionate scene between her and another man and was like, I want Scully to have sex with someone else. It is important to me that this character gets to do this. And it was originally in the script that they have a whole sex scene. And Chris Carter read the script and was like, no, 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 no. Absolutely the fuck not. We're not doing that. And like completely cut it out because apparently he's an OTP guy. And it's like, <laughs> <laughs> these two only, we're not doing this. And so they like settled on... Her, them like making out while he's shirtless and her waking up in his shirt. So it's like implied. And violently like looming over her. Right. And so there's. And she's like into this. Yeah. And there's this like implication that some, that if nothing else, they've had this like passionate moment, even if they wink, didn't fuck. But Chris Carter was like, no, 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 no. I mean, the <laughs> Jodie Foster tattoo says like burn these sheets. Yeah. <laughs> like, it's like, okay. These sheets have been soiled right. by this woman. <laughs> Not just because she slept on them. It's There's more than that going on. Yeah. And so I like too that that Jillian Anderson is like, it is important that we establish like Scully is more than just Mulder at this point, especially because as the series goes on, like that's not the case. <laughs> she definitely becomes more and more like absolutely inextricably intertwined with his life. And like, yeah. this feels like that point of no return in lots of ways, which I like a lot. Here's a fun fact about this episode. It was originally supposed to be directed by Quentin Tarantino. Yikes. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Blah. Blah. <laughs> Yeah, it was originally pitched to him. Uh, More feet. Yeah, right? We would have just had a lot of Jillian Anderson's feet in this episode. The tattoo would have been on the foot. Oh, absolutely. 100%. <laughs> You're totally right. <laughs> uh, they like wrote the whole thing, anticipated that he was going to direct it. And then the Director's Guild of America was like, uh, go fuck yourself. Because he directed an episode of ER and refused to join the director's guild even though that was like okay you can't direct this episode of er unless you join the director's guild and he's like yeah yeah i will i will and then refused to do it and they were like you will never it. work in television ever again go fuck yourself <laughs> the staff of the x-files said we bow to quentin's philosophical stance and we hope something can be worked out in the future which means he doesn't believe in unions and doesn't want to join them which also feels like it makes sense about what happened with Uma Thurman the fact that he's like I'm gonna fight unions at every single fucking turn that I can like cool 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 you're a huge piece of shit also not that talented yeah just put it out there I like some of his movies and there are things that I enjoy about his directorial choices but after a while I'm just like okay I've seen this a thousand times yeah but also when a director works with the same cinematographer over and over again you're like is it the director or is it the cinematographer? Yes, absolutely. 100%. <laughs> and I have a feeling. There was like for a while it was there was a rumor or like whatever that the new the next Star Trek movie was going to be directed by Quentin Tarantino and I was gonna, I think that would have killed me. <laughs> I think <laughs> yeah. yeah, I feel like that would have broke me. Like I would have had a full psychotic break and be like that's it. I can't do this. Well, <laughs> yeah, it's not great. You We're could have a gritty episode without a douchebag. Yeah. as a director absolutely I completely agree I'm really glad that it did not work out that way did, he does not belong on the X-Files in my opinion like that's I don't need it I don't I hope that, that they never ever do that <laughs> it's no fucking thank you <laughs> very bizarre thing about this this script was originally developed the two Morgan and Wong originally developed this script as a quote sort of Abraham Lincoln's ghost in the White House type of thing <laughs> 
<laughs> doesn't make any fucking sense. What does that mean? Doesn't mean anything. <laughs> the idea of like a specter that's like controlling things in the White House. It's, it doesn't make any sense. Like that this was where this originally started. And so the idea was that they were going to have Mulder and Scully investigating this, but they wound up completely changing the script because... Morgan explained that they had, like, done a lot of research about this and had always wanted to write an episode that was, like, Lincoln's Ghost or whatever. But they had to do so many rewrites for Musings of a Cigarette Smoking Man, which came very closely before this, that Morgan and Wong both lost interest in the original story and were like, fuck it, whatever, we'll just rewrite it this way. (laughs) Whatever, it's tattooed, moving on. Also, this is their last episode until they come back for the revivals in uh, 2016. Interesting. It's a good episode to go out on. Absolutely. And it's interesting, too, that they were like, we really wanted to do this thing. We're so frustrated with the amount of rewrites we had to do for this other one. We're going to do this one thing that Jillian specifically asked us for. And then, fuck it, we're out. Like, I like that this is kind of their wrap up of it, too. And like we talked last episode about Vince Gilligan and how he comes in and he becomes like one of the head writers. And so it's interesting to see we already talked about Darren Morgan's last episode. And so it's interesting to see as we get closer to what would have been the original end of the series, how all of those writers just like drop away. It's very Star Trek where they're like, we're out. <laughs> I feel like that happens a lot with like syndicated TV where they're like, oh, this is ending goodbye. And yeah. that's part of the reason why when things get renewed, they're like, oh, fuck, uh, we don't know what to do. All of the good writers left. Right. Yeah. Yep. I agree. Most of the reviews for this are positive. Unsurprisingly, this is a really fucking good episode. And a lot of the positive reviews are about Jillian Anderson and Scully and her performance in this episode. Obviously, she does a fucking great job. The biggest criticism is about Mulder's reactions in the episode, calling him a spoiled ass, which like, yes. Hey, we got brats in both episodes. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Spoiled brats who think <laughs> that the world revolves around them and like cannot understand when people need to say no to them. Definitely parallels in this. And a bunch of people noted that there was a little boy ignored feel to his dialogue at the end, which is true. Like that is how he feels. And again, I think that that's part of what drives him towards this realization of, I got to try harder. Like your life is my life and that's important to me. And I'm not doing a good job. (laughs) Both as like a partner and as someone who considers myself your friend, like, Oh, oops. (laughs) I have fucked up truly, truly and sincerely in a way I uh, cannot get out of. Oh, fuck. Oh, fuck. (laughs) Some of the other criticism is that because of the change in air dates, this episode reads as a response to her cancer, where originally that was not intended. But like, again, I think, ultimately it plays in the favor of how they write the rest of the series like this is such an important episode for scully and it makes sense as a reaction but at the same time like you said i think it also works totally the way it was intended as i'm so fucking tired of Mulder. i've spent four seasons going along with his bullshit what the fuck did i do with my life and especially you haven't seen a lot of this but something that you'll see as you like fill in the rest of the series her family constantly is like, you made a terrible <laughs> mistake. You should have been a doctor. You never should have joined the FBI. I can't believe you've given up your life to be with this motherfucking idiot. Her brother, Bill, constantly, every time he's on the show, is like, fuck Mulder. <laughs> Fuck you for making this choice to align yourself with this idiot. And so it makes sense that up till now we've like really built to this point. Melissa's been murdered at this point, correct? I think so. Because that's when it really hits ahead. Because they they blame like they absolutely blame Mulder for her death, even though like it's not really his fault. It's she's connected, like, even if she had been an FBI agent, like this could have happened anyway. But like she's connected like mob style. I mean, it's it's complicated, but... Uh, piece of the action. Yeah, piece of the action. Uh, <laughs> but, like, it it really builds up until this point, too, of it's like, what have I fucking done with my life? Yeah. And then it's like, oh, I'm in, in for a penny, in for a pound. I guess I'm with this dude till I fucking die. <laughs> yeah, I'm glad you like this. I really like this episode. I think it's really fucking good. Yeah, The Blessing Way is season three. Okay, that's what so I thought. So we've done it already. Yeah. yeah, okay, that's what I thought. Yeah, Bill hates her guts hates his guts bill hates Mulder's guts so hard like yells at him in a hospital and he's like fuck you <laughs> Mulder gets yelled at, at hospitals a lot yeah i mean he spends a lot of times in hospitals because <laughs> he puts people in the hospital a lot because of his negligence and shooting them sort of he doesn't really shoot people scully shoots people <laughs> <laughs> I know I brought this up, and I know you don't want to read Skull or Skinner fic, but this does remind me of a fic that I read where Scully finds out that she has cancer and, like, goes out to do a bunch of dangerous shit, and Skinner is, he follows her and is like, do you want danger? I'll give you danger. 
<laughs> because he's like, uh, you're going to be very reckless and I want to both protect you, but also like, I'll give you what you want. <laughs> and it is very good. <laughs> so, yeah, that thing is definitely based on this episode. If you want that link, <laughs> it's good. <laughs> Snaps a showdown? Yes. Mulder Mulder's so hard he sends Scully into a tailspin midlife crisis where she fucks a deranged stranger, gets an impulse tattoo laced with parasites, and almost gets Sweeney Todd into a furnace. But not everything is about you, Mulder. Gosh! Does it count as a threesome as if the tattoo is sentient? <laughs> <laughs> King Bingo! King Bingo! <laughs> Are you ready for a deep throats vision log? You just cucked that tattoo. <laughs> <laughs> it is the accidental king episode. I'm aware. It's, it's an excellent build on accidental top of it. Accidental threesome? <laughs> hey, it's on hey. the video card. <laughs> uh, yeah, deep throats vision log. Let's do it. <laughs> Captain Dad. Ancient Earth costume. Course painting, what is it? It's, um... Starting with Alon of Troyes. So, as Stel mentioned, this is both written and directed by John Meredith Lucas. Lucas was a producer on most of season two of the show, so he was heavily familiar with everything going on at this point. I think that's why they give him the writer-director switch up. Also, it's probably just easier if he's working as the writer-director and producer of this. You should be like, oh yeah, John's got this one. I'm familiar. <laughs> oh yes, yes, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Speaking of, is it the director slash, is it the cinematographer? This is Gerald Finnerman's last Trek episode. Uh, he was so, so influential as cinematographer for TOS in all of the ways things are shot. So much of that mood lighting, all of that stuff was Finnerman. So that this is him leaving the show as well. This is also the final appearance of Eddie Paskey as Lieutenant Leslie. In this episode, Vinci's uniform bears the stripes of Lieutenant Commander, so great for him. He's been a background character for so long. That dinner scene where she's at the table just, like, shoveling food in her <laughs> green mouth. Drink, <laughs> eating green space chicken and drinking directly from the bottle. In that bottle is supposed to be Saurian brandy. However, that bottle is actually a George Dickel commemorative edition powder horn whiskey bottle. Oh. That sounds delicious. <laughs> well, it's a bottle that's used all the time, too. Yeah. Like, it's in background shots all the time. And I think... fucking cool. Is it the... Oh, I don't know. Is it the bottle that evil Kirk drinks out of in the... Yes. In the body? Okay. I noticed it immediately. It was yeah. like, oh, I've seen that bottle before. Okay. <laughs> it's the evil bottle. Yeah, that's exactly what it it's feels like. It's the evil like. bottle. We haven't seen that episode. Oh, I thought you meant in the... he. Uh, I think that he drinks out of it in the Mirror Universe one, too. Who he does drink out of it in the Mirror Universe one. Yeah. Right. He also drinks... Anyways, he drinks... Evil Kirk drinks it's, out of it. It's the it's evil, evil bottle. bottle. Yeah. Producer Fred Freiberger noted that the episode was intended to appeal to women who weren't into the show or into sci-fi fiction yet. He follows that up with, we tried to get a segment of audience we couldn't otherwise reach and didn't succeed. <laughs> <laughs> also, LOL, so many women watch the show. I'm oh, very yeah, confused by the, the yes. like Nielsen ratings or whatever, like di- demographics there. That doesn't make any sense. The sure. show was literally saved by women. Everybody shut up. We've talked a couple times of costumes from this being auctioned off and like the lavish amounts that they go through. A lot of con stuff, some of... Kirk and Spock stuff from the Mirror Universe episodes. Also, the incomplete body armor worn by Tony Young as Crichton was sold in a Christie's 40 Years of Star Trek The Collection auction. How much do you think it went for? Well, placemats retail about 99 cents a placemat. And there's probably like, I have no idea. Aaron? $6,000. $800. Oh, really? He was like, I found a huge character, but this episode seems important. Also, weird historical context of this, during the filming of this episode was also when Robert Kennedy was assassinated. Oh, great. And Franz Nguyen, who Stell mentioned earlier plays Alon, was a huge supporter of him. And it apparently wrecked her a bunch during the filming of this. Yikes. As it would. Yeah. I mean, yeah. That's a national tragedy. That was big for a lot of people, right? Moving on to some casting stuff, that is K.L. Smith as the very stern and very brief Klingon. 
He has guest appearances on numerous television series, including Gunsmoke, Rawhide, The Untouchables, Wagon Train, Bonanza, The Virginian, and Gene Roddenberry's own The Lieutenant. He also has an uncredited appearance along with Leonard Nimoy in the classic science fiction film Them. Other feature film credits include The Wild One, Pushover, Oh, Rosalinda, and the Elvis Presley movies Jailhouse Rock and Roustabout. Interesting. That's Charles Beck as guard number two for Alan. This is his only acting role. Oh, fun. Conversely, as guard number one, who is the taller and more flatter nose, that's Dick Durock. If you find your eyes kind of drawn to him in a weird way or he sticks out for you in some vague memory of your mind, it's probably because you too are also horny for monsters because Dick goes on to play Swamp Thing in both Swamp yeah. Thing movies and in the TV series. We are very horny for Swamp Thing in this house. <laughs> Adrian Barbo. So strong, so viney. Uh, he be begins his career as a stunt double in Lost in Space. Some of his other film credits include The Enforcer, The Nude Bomb, Coast to Coast, Any Which Way You Can, Silverado, Raw Deal, Stand By Me, Blind Date, Delirious, and Die Hard with a Vengeance. He was notable enough to get put in one of those Academy Awards in Memorandum Things after he died uh, January of 2010. That is Victor Brandt as Watson in this, one of the background characters. We also see him in the Upcoming in season three episode, The Way to Eden as Tongo Rad. Space uh, Hippies. Okay, yeah. So you pointed at her and I was like, The Way to Eden is the Star Trek episode. <laughs> yeah, yeah. But we'll get to it later. Yeah, yeah. That's yeah. why I'm not talking about oh, it Oh, The Way to Eden is very fun. The Way to Eden is very fun. And he's very prominent in it. So we'll probably oh, talk about it. Is he one of the hippies? Yeah. His name so is Tongo Rad. Yeah, yeah. Okay. So he's not a Herbert. <laughs> what are you naming a <laughs> space hippie? <laughs> Also seen as a crew member is Lee Duncan as Evans. He played a character with the same name, that name being Justice Thomas, in two different TV shows on Picket Fences and in Boston Legal. Also did work on Mission Impossible, The Mod Squad, Then Came Bronson, The Odd Couple, Knight Rider, Seventh Heaven, The Pretender, and as Al Caudry in Red Rum, the season eight, episode six, X-Files episode. Oh, okay. Hey, we got an we got a direct link. So that's the actor of color that you pointed out. It was just like he's very good looking. Yeah. He's also in Red Rum. Okay. Oh man, I would never have made that connection. Because he's super a lot older then. Yeah, that's true. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, season two, having a lot of these bingos. Yeah. Very, very interesting. As Crichton yeah, podcasting. <laughs> I guess. I don't know. Or it's just like weird sci fi connecting things. Well it's weird that these themes all fell into this season of extracts. Yeah, definitely. As Crichton, that's the aforementioned Tony Young. He was married to fellow TOS guest actress Madeline Rue, who is Marley McGivers mm -hmm. in Space Seed. Young and Rue also co-starred with each other in the 1964 Western He Rides Tall, and after their divorce would also co-star again with one another in the 1974 made-for-television movie The Sex Symbol. He was also known for his lead work on the series Gunslinger and guest appearances on The Virginian, Maddox, Mission Impossible, as well as Fantasy Island, in which he appeared with his wife's Space Seed co-star, Ricardo Montalban. Oh, cool. It's Hollywood. <laughs> yeah, that's how it works. He also appeared in the 1975 TV movie The Lives of Jenny Dolan, also starred in the 1964 Western Taggart, in which he played the title role, the 1969 Western Charo, co-starring Elvis Presley, and the 1973 thriller Outfit. He also did voiceover work on the Spider-Man cartoon series, and his last credit is an episode of Quantum Leap with future Starship Captain Scott Bakula. Bringing us to Jay Robinson as Petri, the tired <laughs> queen, and boy, aren't you kidding. He did early Broadway theater work in Shakespeare shows like As You Like It and Much Ado About Nothing, but is best known for his 1953 film debut, in his role as Caligula in The Robe, which he apprised again in Demetrius and the Gladiators. Oh, that's a funny choice for Caligula. <laughs> that's really funny to me. His whole career, uh, we'll discuss what happens to him, but his whole career is walking that knife edge of too campy and dramatic, but it working really yeah. well for him. He was also known uh, in the 50s for his standout role in The Wild Party. 
However, early fame led to a drug problem and a few sentences, but he left Hollywood and did some regular people jobs, got himself sober, and this is actually him on his comeback that we see in this episode. Oh, that's great. Yeah, that he rules. kicked some ass. He played Julius Caesar on an episode of Bewitched in 64. That makes sense. <laughs> he was in the Betty Davis flop, Bunny O'Hare. But doing these things like Trek and all of those kind of brought him back. He goes on to play a role in Woody Allen's Everything You Ever Wanted to Know About Sex But Were Afraid to Ask, Warren Beatty's Shampoo, and Big Top Pee Wee in 88. And he's in Dr. Shrinker and The Croft Super Show for one season and a bunch of made-for-video Shakespeare performances like Macbeth, Othello, More of Venice, and Richard II. I need to look more into that because I probably watched a bunch of those in school and mm -hmm. he might be in them as well. Yeah. He also had some horror roles, of course, with his gravitas, like Train Ride to Hollywood, in which he played Dracula, Transylvania Twist, in which he played Dracula, and Bram Stoker's Dracula, in which he played Mr. Hawkins. <laughs> Interesting. As well as being on 50 episodes of Days of Our Lives as Monty Dolan, because, yes, that yep. is absolutely a soap opera actor. Yeah. Yes. In 77, he was the host of Discovery Channel's Beyond Bizarre, and his last TV work was providing voices for the animated comedy series Mad Jack the Pirate. We stand a tired queen. <laughs> and once again, that is France Nguyen Azalon. She was born in France to a French mother and a Vietnamese father. After her mother and grandfather were persecuted by the occupying Germans during World War II for being Roma, she was raised in Marseille by a cousin. So she actually has a couple of quotes where she felt out of touch with her ethnicity because she was raised so French. She was working as a seamstress in 1955 when she was discovered by a photographer for Life magazine. She came to America in 56 and became a member of the Strasbourg Acting Studio in New York. She makes her film debut portraying Liet in the hit 1958 film version of the stage musical South Pacific. Nguyen followed this with a role in the 58 film adaptation of In Love and War, these two films earning her a Golden Globe nomination for Most Promising Female Newcomer. So she hit the scene hard. Later that same year is when she begins the Broadway role opposite Shatner in The World of Susie Wong. She won a 58 Theater World Award for her performance in that play. Later, she does films like Diamond Head, Dimension 5, uh, episodes in The Man from Uncle, Gunsmoke, Hawaii 5 an episode of The Six Million Dollar Man with George Takei, Outer Limits, recurring roles on St. Elsewhere and Knott's Landing, Battle for Planet of the Apes, The Joy Luck Club, and The Battle of Shaker Heights. In addition to acting and once retiring from acting, she became a certified psychologist. She received a master's degree in clinical psychology in 1986 and became a psychological counselor for abused women, children, women in prison, and drug abusers. Oh, she fucking, she rules. fucking rules. She was named Women of the Year in 89 for her psychology work and in numerous commendations and awards as well on top of that. So, like, she fucks. She fucks. <laughs> That's wild. To have like a whole career and then be like, you know what I'm going to do? I'm going to get my master's in psychology. like And help a bunch of people. That's not easy to do. Like, fucking good for her. Yeah. I mean, she didn't go into this wanting to be an actor. She yeah. got noticed. Discovered. She discovered and did some amazing work and then was like, no, here's what I actually really wanted to do with my life all along. That rules. Good for her. <laughs> Moving on to Never Again. Uh, this was... Thankfully directed by Rob Bowman <laughs> and no one else. And no one else. And as Aaron said, this was written by Morgan and Wong. Morgan and Wong leave after this, but they leave to executive produce Millennium. Yeah, that makes sense. Also, that sex scene that you talked about and them including this in Carter cutting, that was actually the only scene of theirs that Carter ever cut. Really? Script wild. And Glenn Morgan, I believe, is quoted as saying... He thinks it's because Carter thought they were fucking with him. Why? Like they thought he They were messing with his OTP. Yeah, I guess so. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. They they said Carter thought it was a joke that they wrote a sex scene in it. Why? I don't know. That's so weird. So Scully's Ouroboros tattoo, we've talked a little bit about here. The Ouroboros, however, is also the symbol of the Millennium Group, which is a oh. huge part of the TV show Millennium. <laughs> I also forgot to say she offered to really get that tattoo and the cast and crew told her it would take too long and it would be <laughs> impractical. <laughs> and also, you don't need to do that. 
<laughs> Julian Anderson goes hard. Yeah, I mean, I'm I, I'm for it. I understand I that. It. Oh, so she's like, this character's supposed to have a tattoo from now on, and they like never talk about it right, ever again. Right. One thing that's missed, depending on where you're streaming this from, and unless you're watching like the high quality DVD releases, is that Betty's voice is constantly being mixed, alternating left and right in the stereo channel. Oh, cool. So if you have headphones on, she's literally bouncing around his head side. Oh, to side. that's interesting. I could tell that it was there's something like kind of off about it, which like was really effective. Yeah, yeah. Kay Schilling, the downstairs neighbor, shares her name with an Entertainment Weekly editor, Mary Kay Schilling. Apparently, this was an inside joke that Morgan and Wong had written into it because Entertainment Weekly had not been giving the show good reviews. <laughs> Hilarious. Petty. Also seen very briefly in her establishing shot is her sliding some lining under her birdcage. That is an, a fake Entertainment Weekly magazine stating that X-Files producer Bob Goodwin was the wisest man in Hollywood and also has David Duchovny on the cover of it. Oh, my God. They went hard. Props department went deep. <laughs> On the list of Mulder's five like Russian immigrant agents that he slides to Scully are some obvious joke names. Igor Gorbachev is a Russian actor. Vladimir Novikov is a famous Russian novelist. And on that list is also Yakov Smirnov. <laughs> Mulder's an idiot. <laughs> yeah, he is. He's a fucking moron. Ergot poisoning, which is the main MacGuffin here is actually a real thing and was thought to be part of a lot of the sensationalism and group confusion around the Salem witch trials. So that infestation of rye and other grains like that were thought to have been traced from there. Records of outbreaks go back from 1200 and have occurred as recently as 2001. Great. <laughs> Also, some social math here from a quote Scully tells Jerst. Glenn Gary, Glenn Ross came out in 1992. Of course, it's a mammoth play, but that movie and that chronology leads it to it kind of being assumed that it's been five years since Dana Scully has had a date. Yeah, and she's been in the X-Files for four. Mm -hmm. <laughs> we wonder what happened there. Yeah, it must have been when she broke up with What's His Fuck that they did the Bonnie and Clyde episode with. Yep. Yeah. yeah. She says it at the beginning of that episode, like, he was the last relationship that I had. So it makes sense that they had this horrible breakup. And she's like, oh, man, never date an FBI agent again. Psych! Just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> We're rooting for Dana. We're rooting for her always. Moving on to some casting stuff. Seen briefly as a store owner, that is Natasha Visulik. She also has a stunt cred in I Want to Believe. A couple of episodes of SG-1, she's Galena on Arrow and voices the Baba Yaga on DC Legends of Tomorrow. Seen... Also very briefly is Jen Forgey as Ed's ex-wife. She's also in the episode Two Fathers as a Nurse and in the episode The Red and the Black as a Nurse. Dead casting. She also has voiceover credits, including May Kanker and Naz on Ed, Ed, and Eddie, Young Keita on Inuyasha, and has live action roles on The L Word as Amy and more. Vesevlov Pudovin is played by Igor Morozov. <laughs> He's also in the episode Terma as a Russian horseman and also a Russian soldier in a couple of SG-1 episodes. Miss Haddon is played by Jen Bailey Mattia. She also did guest work on The Sentinel, Poltergeist the Legacy, Sliders, and The Crow Stairway to Heaven. As the aforementioned Kay Schilling is Jillian Fargy. She becomes one of those bit actors in this that does an immense amount of guest work in Canadian television again after this. Guest roles in Xenon, Twilight Zone, True Calling, The Dead Zone, Eureka, iZombie, five episodes of Bates Motel is Maggie Summers, Alter Carbon, and a Supernatural episode, Out of Darkness, Into the Fire, as Deb. Oh, she's good in that episode. That's the first episode of season 11. Oh, yeah. Yeah, she's good. She's still getting a bunch of work now. As one of the very well-timed detectives, that's Detective Smith, and that's played by Ian Robeson. He's also a ranger in Chinga, a computer monitor in the Millennium episode The Time Is Now, and an ER doctor in the Millennium episode Saturday Dreaming of Mercury. He's also in the movie Antitrust, some Outer Limits episodes, return roles on SG-1 as Frank Mitchell, Kyle XY Fringe, and another Supernatural episode called Swap Meet, M-E-A-T, as Donna's husband. Oh, okay, yeah. That was that, enough? Yeah, that's enough. I love Donna. He's a dick. The other older detective is Detective 
Gouvia, G-O-U-V-E-I-A. And he's played by Jay Donahue. Jay Donahue has a relatively short credits list. However, one of them is being an original guest actor, uh, and a guest actor on the original Battlestar Galactica. Oh, shit. Instead of the new, more current one, which well, I the thought better was one. interesting. <laughs> yeah. I said the boring one in reference to the old one. Yeah. I tried to watch it, and I was like, not even my completest brain can deal with this. Yeah. No, no, no. <laughs> not for me. As Hannah, that's BJ Harrison. She's also a clerk in Blood, also known for Rise of the Planet of the Apes, 2012 and the tooth fairy starring the rock also guest roles on the outer limits crow stairway to heaven the together tv movie background roles yeah to get her <laughs> in love no, uh, together yes. yeah yes i, I do mean both of their <laughs> yeah. albums still um, yeah the music is pretty funny <laughs> it's really good <laughs> i put that note in for me i'm so glad other people <laughs> oh still God, remember I love together yeah. <laughs> So fucking good. (laughs) We need to teach the kids. Uh, (laughs) She had background roles in the first Battlestar Galactica reboot episodes. Also, True Calling, The Blade TV Show, Stargate Atlantis, Fringe, Psych, Imposters, and more recently has been Mrs. Bass on a series of unfortunate events and Mrs. Curtis on The Chilling Adventures of Sabrina. That's Bill Croft as Comrade Svo. He's also... Kalusari number two in the X-Files episode Kalusari and Broadface on the Millennium episode Maranatha. Who names these Millennium episodes? People who worked with Chris Carter. He was also played Kuntz in the TV miniseries of It. Oh, okay. He has returned guest roles on MacGyver, back to Stephen King, Andy Clutterbuck in Needful Things, The Commish, The Sentinel, Poltergeist, Crow, Outer Limits. He was Sindar on SG-1, three return roles on Arrow as Grizzly Man. Recently voiced Beelzebub on DC Legends of Tomorrow and also did a Supernatural episode. He's in 2014's Sharp Teeth as a farmer. I don't know. I can't remember all these episodes. (laughs) I gotta look. Oh, it's season nine. Oh, that's the episode where the Garth is like, I'm a werewolf now. And they're like, werewolves are bad. And he's like, no, no, no. These werewolves are okay. Except for some of them are not okay. <laughs> sure. <laughs> <laughs> Which brings us to Jodie Foster as the voice of Betty and also making a small appearance as a frightened woman in the office in the episode. So many people overlook that that's actually her. I didn't even notice Me that. Either. When he runs in and was like, who the fuck said that? Say it to my face. She's... Staged a lot shorter and in the back, but that's Jodie Foster. I'm looking that up. That rules. I have no... I've seen this episode so many times. Exactly the same. I didn't think that was her. That's wild. I just assumed that she came in and did, like, voiceover work. I didn't know she was actually on set for that. That rules. Jodie Foster is a friend of the series casting agent, Randy Stone, and also a huge fan of the show. So when she was asked, she was like, oh, absolutely, I'll do this. She nailed all her line readings in under an hour. <laughs> just, Fuck you, Jodie Foster. Just knocked it out. <laughs> so great. That's funny, but like she seems like way too big of a star to be on this show. So a year before this, she also does a small voice role, like a, a recorded message in an episode of Frasier. Maybe she just likes to have fun. And then a couple of you know, a couple of years later she does a Simpsons episode, but she doesn't do a lot of TV after her TV childhood acting yeah. career. A lot has gone into why they sought. A lot of thought has gone into why they sought after Jodie Foster to do this. There's a couple of perspective reasons. One being that horrible stalker that she had that was obsessed with her, oh, yeah. who tried to assassinate Ronald Reagan. Wild. <laughs> And the other more obvious one is her portrayal of Clarice Starling in The Silence of the Lambs, which was cited as being a inspiration for the character of Dana Scully. Mm-hmm. Side note there, Anderson may have played Clarice Starling in the 2000 Hannibal film, if not for a clause in her Fox contract that barred her from playing other FBI agent characters. Interesting. Shitty. So she just went on to play his insanely eccentric therapist later in life. Slash lover? (laughs) Yes, definitely. I'm so sad they didn't fuck that dude in Italy before they killed him. Well, he was kind of a piece of shit. (laughs) Actually, yes. He deserved to die. Not everybody in Hannibal deserves to die. That guy kind of deserved to die. (laughs) Uh, Yeah, it's Jodie Foster from being a Disney and TV child actor to a breakout role in Taxi Driver, which she won under... uh, she went on to receive two Oscars before turning 30 for The Accused and Silence of the Lambs. 
She does awesome in this. Yeah, she's she, very famous. She knocked it out. <laughs> Contact. So this is this is 1997. This is the same year as Contact. Aliens. <laughs> she's into it. Recording. <laughs> Sure, we'll do some spooky stuff. Let's go. I had to watch Contact in like a science class in high school once. They were like, we, I, the teacher is like, I need an off day. Do some grading. Here's Contact. <laughs> some of the, I watched a while of this shit in science class because I definitely watched Dante's Peak. <laughs> not oh my God. The not movie. scientific at all. We definitely watch Contact. <laughs> like, what the fuck? Holy shit. And that brings us to Rodney Rowland as Ed Jerse. He was one of the main characters of Space Above and Beyond. So Morgan and Wong brought him on to do this. Space Above and Beyond was actually his big break. And he was said to be so intense in his acting that on one of the episodes of Space Above and Beyond, Who Monitors the Birds, he was hospitalized twice due to exhaustion. Good Lord. It's called acting. Calm down. <laughs> yeah, right. Read about it's called it. acting. Surprising to no one after watching this episode, he did actually date Gillian Anderson for a bit yeah. after this. Uh, when Gillian Anderson and Sexual the X Files, magnetism. Yeah. <laughs> when Gillian Anderson and the X Files won Emmy awards the year following, he was her date to the Emmys, and as she won, she kissed David Duchovny and then him. <laughs> <laughs> Yikes! Yeah. Also surprising to no one before this, he was a model for Calvin Klein, J Crew, and Perry Ellis. After doing Space Above and Beyond for 23 episodes and this, he's also on 22 episodes of Pensacola Wings of Gold. Small guest roles in Dark Angel, VIP, Angel, Charmed, The OC, a bunch of NCIS CSIs, Weeds, Castle, Grey's Anatomy, Twin Peaks, eight episodes. It's a returning character, Liam Fitzpatrick on Veronica Mars. Recent roles include Baxter on The Walking Dead, which just happened this year, Finch on the MacGyver reboot, and he has a bunch of stuff in post-production, too. He's for him. He's a pretty man. He is very pretty. <laughs> Anyways, now that's it. Uh, thanks and always watch the credits. Bye. Yeah, well, you can tell what's going on in somebody's head just by looking at them. I mean, they're probably thinking that we're the ones that are screwed up. Are we? Who knows? And now for our overall thoughts, this fake theme that we made a real theme. <laughs> Which we did twice this season. <laughs> the, ac <laughs> the accidental kink episode. So they fit together because... Lots of people discovering lots of things about themselves in this episode. Lots of self-discovery. <laughs> yep. Mm -hmm. Go through and name them. Um, being slapped in the face. Being dominated. Both episodes are about <laughs> women being like, oh, I'm actually really into being dominated. <laughs> I don't know if I'm into this, but I'm into this. Spanking. <laughs> Spanking. Tattoos. Yeah, pain, I guess, in general. <laughs> yeah, there's some like light BDSM that happens in Never Again as well. Threesomes, maybe. <laughs> maybe. <laughs> maybe. A little bit of tattoo cucking, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Kissing a girl while your two boyfriends watch. <laughs> cucking. <laughs> <laughs> uh, a lot of forced cucking in these episodes <laughs> being in love with a machine over a person I guess uh, yeah these are I mean for two episodes that are wildly fucking different in like every conceivable Tone way and vibe. <laughs> yeah. there is a lot of similarities because we like obviously we pick a theme and sometimes stick to it sometimes <laughs> sometimes but, like these are good back-to-back -back episodes too it feels like the chaos of a lot of trias yes against like the very like dark and edgy sort of like personal chaos of never again i felt like they fit together really well too so casual fan questionnaire as a casual fan would you recommend this episode to a newbie no absolutely <laughs> fucking not <laughs> yeah no hard no it's a hard no <laughs> nope no i you need like a whole season's worth basically to get to the point where you can be like well, what is happening here <laughs> yeah this is similar to like the last episode where it's like you kind of can't watch these two people fight without already knowing their relationship yeah so it'd be hard to watch this episode and be like why do they hate each other why yeah. doesn't she have a desk <laughs> 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 what is the scene or moment from this episode that you won't forget? Spones being accidentally cucked. Jim! 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 <laughs> it 
it was just so good. The doors open and they're just like pissed. <laughs> also, the costumes, they were really fucking good. They were something. Which scene won't you forget? Honestly, her like, I have daddy issues monologue is pretty intense. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Like, it's not like there are more exciting scenes and sexier scenes and like spooky scenes, but that scene is like a pretty intense scene of being like, well, stranger, I like to fuck older dudes because I wanted to impress my dead dad. Yeah. <laughs> so, do you want to pay? <laughs> Hey, recently divorced man going through real personal trauma. What a fuck. <laughs> yeah. Uh, who are you shipping? I don't know. Even like that very sponsy moment. This isn't really a very shippy episode, I don't think. Like there's like they obviously want to help Kirk, but it doesn't feel like super sexual. Yeah, it feels like background established mix Burke. Like, yeah. We'll get through this together, I guess. Yeah, we'll make it to the other side. And obviously there's that like sponsy moment at the end of like, what did you I you agree with me? Yeah. <laughs> what the fuck just happened here? Who the fuck are you? Did you yeah. get cried? On? <laughs> <laughs> uh, <laughs> yeah, there's not. I didn't really get a lot of shippy feels from this episode. Weirdly, <laughs> maybe surprisingly. <laughs> what about you? Were you shipping Mulder and Scully at any point in this no, fucking I guess train wreck? Data ride? and the dude she fucked. <laughs> like they had some chemistry. <laughs> guess them. Fair enough. <laughs> It's this episode of Fuck Fine or a Flop. I want to say a fuck, but I don't know if it actually, it's so chaotic. Like, it could be a fine. <laughs> yeah, I think it's, it sits somewhere between fuck minus fine plus. <laughs> Tip <Dip> inflection. <laughs> yeah, fine. This is a fine episode. Just fine. <laughs> but it doesn't. That's the thing is I enjoyed right. a lot of it. And so I feel like it sits more on that like fuck minus side. Okay. There's just so much that's going on. It's a lot. Lots but it does of, come together at the end. Right. There's just a lot to emotionally process about this script. I think that's a big part of yeah. it. And, I mean, we didn't talk about this because I don't think it reads this way at all. But, like, there is a reading of this that could be, like, Kirk suffers kind of a sexual assault because he's, like, yeah. love potion whammy. Yeah. Like, there is definitely, if you, if you, you could easily read it that way, too. Right. And, like, I thought at the time that she was, like, a double agent, too. And so it. That's what I was expecting to happen at any moment is for him to find out like, oh, shit. <laughs> yeah. Oops. I think it, it doesn't read that way for me because of the scene that they had their fa- farewell scene together right. and how it is. Which is like, the context of it. Right. It makes a lot more sense. But when you're still trying to figure out like what is her role in this takeover plot, it does read a lot more ambiguously about yeah. like, are you just fucking him to like fuck with him? Like that is a little more great in that moment of the first watch. Totally. Also, it doesn't ever seem like Kirk completely loses agency. That's true. He's it, fighting yeah, the whole it's time. It's a huge part of it. Well, and also when, like, she shouldn't be on the bridge, he has that moment with Spock of just like, you don't fucking... No, wait, you're right. Yeah. And then goes back to him and be like, go down to the med bay, da, 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 whatever. Like, he's never completely whammied. It's just a very strong compulsion. Well, he kind of says that he is, though, because he there's that, like, what happened scene where he's yeah. like... What happened was an accident and we should forget about it. And so there's I can see how that reading would come too. if it's what? like, OK, what what happened between us should never have happened. Totally. And it's it's an interesting reading, too, because like if you think about it, the way that the biological agent works, it is supposed to tie them together forever. So even though he chooses the enterprise there, there is an ambiguous ending of like, I won't forget you. I literally can't. So like. Right. Who knows how his feelings, maybe I'll find out in the book Firestorm. (laughs) I hope so. (laughs) I hope Bones still slides him that antidote in his sleep just to like tie that end up. Yeah. It feels like something that Bones would totally do is to like scoop. (laughs) Oh, his boyfriend's doing like medicine while he sleeps to help him. Not something that happens again. (laughs) What about never again? Is this a fuck fine or a flop? This is a fuck. Yeah. This is a great episode. This is a very good episode. Yep. Absolutely. All right. You can find us on the internet. You can follow us at NYD Productions on Twitter and Instagram and interact with the show using the hashtag Pod. You can find me at NYD Urgency on Instagram. You can find me on Twitter at Stella underscore Cheeks. And you can find me on Twitter at Haberdasher 9K. You can also email us at extrexpod at gmail.com with questions or comments. I feel like I don't really even have to make a joke here. Like, I read some crazy shit. This is an accidental kink episode. If you want to test your boundaries, I come bearing a handful of links. (laughs) 
<laughs> and you have an X-Files link for this one. Oh, yeah. And boy, is it good. <laughs> Please come to me for this link. It is very good. That link will end up on our <laughs> NYD Productions Patreon, which you can access along with more special behind the scenes action, like extra podcasts, like unofficial channels, access to our show notes and more for only a dollar on patreon.com slash NYD productions. And don't forget to subscribe wherever you listen to podcasts and to tell your friends. We find this nerdy shit is better when it's shared. We'll see you next time for the Unidentified Alien episode. In the meantime... Believe boldly. Seek truth. Ship proudly. x is created and written by Stella Cheeks, Aaron Klein, and Bobby Hoffman, and produced by Bobby Hoffman for NYD Productions. Our show theme is Alien Spy by Ionix, and our show art was made by Jonathan Curtis. 